the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on this Tuesday, December 14th. Here are all the top market stories that we are following for you at this hour. 2022 inflationary pressures. Prices paid in U.S. producers hit a record 10% in November. We're going to talk to the CEO of the top global supplier for houseware brands, Ravin Gandhi of GMM Nonstick Coatings. And it's the vaccine vindication. Two shots of Pfizer's vaccine may offer 70% protection against hospitalization with Omicron, even though it's more infectious. And getting into cash, Bank of America's fund manager survey shows investors have the highest exposure to cash since May 2020. Do you de-risk for next year? We're going to answer that question with J.P. Morgan's Dubrovko Lakos Bujas. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Um, the fund manager survey we'll discuss in a second, Guy. Yes, it is backward looking, but the allocation to cash was quite staggering. And it raises questions as to what have we seen in the last few weeks? What kind of repositioning are we looking at? Yeah, up until now, it's been about rotation, hasn't it, within the market? Uh, and that has been the narrative. Basically, we've had a rolling rotation. If people have started to shift into, ta into cash, that's a very different narrative going into next year. But maybe, just maybe, you take a look at what Mike Wilson is saying. You take a look at what the long-term chart of the S&P looks like. 2000 looks like a, a blip. 2008 looks like a yeah. blip. Maybe it's people starting to look at those charts. Yeah, do we revisit YOLO and FOMO or are YOLO and FOMO always going to be here now as long as there's all that liquidity? We'll break all that down. We will. We certainly will. I, it's going to be an interesting year next year. Um, a lot of very positive notes coming out at the moment. But as you say, the latest Bank of America Global Fund Manager survey, survey even, survey, showing a defensive, there it is, shift into cash this month. Cash allocations, as Alex says, went up by 14 percentage points. That's the highest exposure to cash since May 2020, which doesn't actually seem that long ago. This <laughs> brings us to our question of the day. Should investors decrease risk into 2022? Let's try and figure this out. John Authors joining me here in the studio. Christina Kino uh, joining us down the line. John, let me start with you. The yeah. fund managers starting maybe to shift into cash. Is that just a year-end effect? Or do you think that is a fundamental review of what central banks are about to do? I, I think it's more of a year-end effect. If you take a look at the rest of the survey, what they're expecting from central banks, they pretty much already have on board what seems to be most likely, that, that, that we are going to get an accelerated taper, that there probably will be two hikes next year, but they don't think that inflation is going to rage out of control beyond there. It's certainly quite interesting that as soon as Powell made his hawkish pivot in the last few weeks... Yep. Uh, what they saw as the greatest risk switched from inflation to uh, overzealousness by central banks. Um, so that's their greatest cause of concern. I think the issue in terms of whether they should reserve risk is that traditionally when you think in terms of risk on and risk off, when you think of yep. reducing risk, it means buying bonds which is exactly what you don't want to do. And that's why do. they're going into cash, right? Yes. I, they're not buying bonds because they're too nervous about bonds, yep. so they're basically shifting into cash. So yes. cash is now serving the same purpose as bonds? Conceivably. Apple Get stock might also be serving much <laughs> the same purpose. Except but, when it uh, gets to $3 trillion yeah. market cap, because then you got other questions. Uh, hey, Christine, um, yes. what are you noticing in terms of how uh, positioning is happening, say, in FX and in the Treasury market? If you're scared of buying Treasuries, then you yeah, hadn't been scared about buying the dollar. No, certainly not, Alex. But I think, you know, very much in the same way that we're looking at the big run-up in, in stocks, the dollar has had a big run-up this year as well, much to the surprise of a lot of people. And certainly questions now starting to come through of whether these expectations that are driving the dollar, which is primarily a tighter Fed policy, is already in price. And so it's going to be interesting to see what we hear from Jay Powell tomorrow when the Fed meets and how that's going to play into the Fed's longer-term trajectory because that could give yep. a lot of potential for the dollar to pull back here. Mm. Christine, though, consensus at the moment, and Cameron Kreis, Cam Kreis is making this point on the M Live. consensus is that the Fed is going to accelerate the taper. It's going to do so reasonably aggressively. That's going to bring forward rate hikes. The expectation is that we're going to see two, maybe three rate hikes next year, certainly two. That's consensus. What does a hawkish Fed actually look like? 
Well, probably they're going to have to beat those uh, already very hawkish consensus expectations, Guy. And that is kind of the problem for the Fed at this moment is uh, they seem to be getting into a bit of a race with markets into um, heading down a more hawkish path. It's very similar to what we've seen, for instance, with markets and the Bank of England. And we know how that ended, right? We're seeing now markets pairing back those very, very hawkish expectations for the Bank of England, especially in light of the developments in the UK over the last couple of days. And so I'm not saying that we might see the same exactly the same situation for the Fed, but it's certainly getting to that stage where markets seem to be. Uh, oh, nope. it looks like we're having a connection issue. It just issue. depends on how they respond. Um, John, in terms yeah. of, say, then where you go for safety, you mentioned Apple. Uh, the fund manager survey was very much that individuals are long tech, but also long Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin safety yes. now? Is it cash in Bitcoin and shorting treasuries? I, I, I hope not. <laughs> I don't regard it as safety. Um, it seems to be behaving more like a risk asset. It's one of the things that goes up when people are worried. Uh, sorry, when people are excited. It's, it's one of the things that correlates, broadly speaking, with, with, uh, with Tesla or with things that you buy when people are, are feeling positive. It is, I have to admit, it's very interesting that uh, it's actually managed to do as well as it's done when uh, gold and silver are actually at this moment still down for the year. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, in terms of the idea that they would, they might actually replace gold and silver as conservative stores of value, they feel you like can... different things. Yes, in in mm. an economic cycle, you're a student of history. In an economic yeah. cycle, yeah. when we get to the point at which the Fed starts tightening, the Fed starts withdrawing mm. stimulus. What is the norm? What is the, what is the historical? story about how assets then react and is this like i hate to say this time is different mm. but given what has come before it are those parallels useful um i suspect we might want to go back to pre-2000 or even pre volcker parallels being more useful at this point because the question we need to ask is if there really is inflation out there then the infl inflation itself becomes much more of an important variable I think the Fed could be much more hawkish in f uh, next year if inflation is still as high as it is now in six months' time, for example. Uh, and that becomes, that becomes part of the equation. In general, if you are fighting inflation and you need to keep raising rates to do it, then that's not good for the stock market or the bond market. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg's John Authors and Christina Kino uh, joining us. And tune into our special coverage, The Fed Decides, as tomorrow, 1.30 p.m. at New York time. All right, coming up, we're going to break down this conversation even more. Should you de-risk into 2022? Well, J.P. Morgan says not so much. S&P forecast for next year among the most bullish. Dubrovka, Lakos, Bujas, J.P. Morgan, global head of equity macro research, sees further stock upside ahead, maybe just not as much as this year. He'll break us down with his call next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get to that question of the day. Do you de-risk into 2022? Dubravko Lakos Bujas, JP Morgan Global Head of Equity Macro Research, uh, joins us now. Dubravko, what's the answer to that question? Do you de-risk in 2022? And, it, and what parts might you de-risk? So we, we think the uh, construct for equities remains uh, positive. Um, you know, when you sort of look at the market, you know, people obviously refer to S&P 500 index, which continues to sort of hover close to highs. Uh, but when you basically look at everything underneath and everything outside of S&P, uh, you have already seen a pretty heavy dose of de-risking. Um, you know, last I looked, when you look at the median and the average stock within S&P, peak to trough, it's down 15, 16, 17, 18 percent. And the drawdown has been happening now for over 30, close to 60 days. And when you look outside of the U.S., international markets, EM markets, I would say the situation is already pretty de-risked. So I think it's really the call it the, the mega caps in the U.S., the top 10 stocks that are holding the ground here. And I think one of the reasons for that is because just simply lack of alternatives. People don't want to go into bonds. Uh, and there is still pretty much the system is pretty much flush with cash. Uh, they don't want to touch high beta stocks. They've de-risked already a decent amount. So they just go into sort of the, the you know, the, the call it the bond proxies, the mega caps that generally have relatively decent fundamentals. Valuations are not as crazy. 
and they have pretty healthy capital return to them. So that's kind of my thing, and you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the backdrop. I don't think you can just look at S and P and sort of say market is yeah. at highs. You got to look at everything else around it. How bumpy is the ride going to be in 2022? Do you think I, there's going to be a lot of things to think about? We're going to have to figure out more precisely what the Fed is going to do. There's certainly risk, it seems, to the upside that the Fed is going to be more aggressive. As we figure that out, where do you think volatility is going to be? So look, I, I think that volatility between now and probably end of 1Q will be on the on the higher side because. You know, everybody's sort of looking at what the Fed is going to do. We basically need to see how inflation comes in. Um, and, and so I think, yeah, there's going to be high ball and there's going to be a bit of a roller coaster ride. But I think if you sort of cut through all of that, uh, just given where expectations are, um, I would ask the question, you know, wh where will there be the bigger surprise? Is the bigger surprise going to come from Fed being even more aggressive than what's being priced in at this point? Or could yeah. the basically Fed surprise of being someone more balanced? Um, let's talk about Omicron and how that feeds into the whole thing. So we're getting more restrictions globally, whether it's travel restrictions, work from home restrictions. Um, what does that do? Is that a growth story or an inflationary story? Because that's going to directly impact the market rhetoric around the Fed. So as far as the latest variant goes, again, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But from all the data and all the analysis we've done, um, we don't think it's going to really alter the outlook in any sort of significant way. Could you get a bit of a delay in the demand cycle and so forth? Absolutely. But I don't think it changes the, the outlook in any meaningful way. Um, transmissibility is high. Severity from everything we continue to see uh, seems to suggest it's not worse than the prior waves. And we do have uh, still the vaccines. We have uh, boosters and we have antivirals that I think should help basically put a floor underneath this uh, issue. So. We, we don't think Omicron is that big of an issue. At this point, we really think it's primarily around the Fed and how aggressively the Fed moves. What is retail doing right now? And I'm not talking about bricks and mortar. I'm talking about retail investors. What is their perception of risk? When you think about this market, it has changed this year. Retail has become a force to think about if you are a professional investor. Do you think retail investors are going to be as aggressive next year when they look at this market? Uh, they've got a whole range of other things to think about. You've got a bumpy crypto story. You've got high gas prices. That, the list just goes on and on. And then you factor in rising interest rates as well. Just in terms of the supports for the market, Kind of where do you see the fragility? So I think that, look, retail uh, plays an important role. Uh, you know, retail, uh, you know, equity allocation has gone up. Um, but I think on a sort of, so I, I think for, for retail to become a risk, you would really need to see a pretty significant unwind in, 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 in financial markets. You would need to see, yeah, if the crypto space completely collapses, you know, that, that's a risk, you know. But, but again, I, I think retail participation within equities from everything we're seeing based on our internal models tends to be very much so theme-specific, stock-specific, uh, rather than necessarily just broad-based, uh, you know, equities. And so, you know, you know wh wh where, where does retail go next year? Retail, I think you look at a job market, it's healthy. You look at uh, balance sheets of retail, it's probably the best it's been in, 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 in probably a decade or two. You look at savings, they're still there, excess savings. So question is just, um, you know, does, the re does retail have power to basically step in further? Mm -hmm. Probably yes, but I, I think a lot of it is a function of sentiment. And so, you know, I, I just don't see retail really stepping out in any meaningful way unless the market completely sort of starts to roll over and some of these other yeah. call it uh, areas such as crypto roll over, you know, at the same time. So as long as like YOLO and FOMO and the retail guys as long as all of that remains true, what do you buy in a dip? What I would be buying at a dip right now is just simply put high beta stocks, high beta stocks. Uh, they've, they've sold off quite aggressively over the last eight to nine months. People right now are basically paying back to close to record premium for low beta and safety and low vol. So what do I mean by high beta? I mean, high beta with encyclicals, I, I think the travel theme has an exceptionally attractive risk reward for 2022. Um, the travel theme, no reason why summer of 22 won't be better than summer of 21 or summer of 2020. And yet these stocks are basically trading back, many of them, to June levels of last year. 
energy theme, I think, is phenomenal. Very attractive risk reward as cross-border activity continues to normalize. And then I think on the growth side, there's a lot of fire sale. And there's a lot of very attractive high beta opportunities there. I mean, just look at a lot of these speculative growth names. They're down 30, 40, 50 percent from highs. So I would be looking at high beta on both sides of the barbell. That's where I think the most attractive opportunity is going into the first half of next year. Dubrovka, does, does the high dollar, just the strong dollar, which we may see as we see policy divergence, keep U.S. money in Europe? The performance difference for a U.S. investor investing in Europe versus a Euro investor investing in Europe is absolutely enormous at the moment. It works the other way around. European stocks, uh, European investors getting a good ride. Just sort of geographically, when you think about how you want to invest next year, how big a factor, how big an FX factor should I be thinking about when I talk about my portfolio? Like, so FX plays a role, but again, I think you really need to see a big move in FX for that to make a big difference. So again, you know, for the dollar, you would probably need to see a four, five, six percent move uh, rather than just sort of a one or two percent move. And so I think within emerging markets, yes, it's played a very big role within, I think, Europe. It's played some role, but less so. I think EM is the bigger one. Look, we think that as you think about 2022, um, in line with sort of this high beta thesis, we think Europe within the developed space and we think emerging markets within a global context both possess a track to risk reward. And one of the centerpieces obviously is China, which mm. has been in a deleveraging mode for the last 12 plus months. And we're definitely seeing signs of pivoting there uh, which we think should persist as you go into next year. So, uh, again, S&P 500 U.S. Yeah. happens to be very concentrated, very sort of heavy in terms of mega caps. We think it's time to sort of diversify. Okay, we're going to get to China uh, in just a moment. But one last quick question on Europe. Does the money leave the U.S. and go to Europe? Where does the money flow out of if you're going to take on that beta? So I think where you could basically see the money flow out of is the mega caps. It's basically that's where all the money has been going. You're basically seeing record concentration, um, you know, globally in 30 plus years. So I, I think that in the first half of next year, uh, assuming inflation basically shows signs of normalization, which we think it will, uh, assuming the Fed ends up being somewhat more balanced and doesn't just continue to basically aggressively move forward with tightening, which I believe the market is pricing in, but it still remains a big question mark. Um, and assuming that the COVID situation starts to come back under control. And I know we're dealing with a lot of headlines now. I do think that you get a rotation from, like I said, lower beta mega caps, where all the money has basically been funneled into, into higher beta, which includes both higher beta within the US, but includes higher beta abroad, which is Europe and parts of EM. Dubravko, let's dig into that in just a moment. I want to get your take on where you want to be positioned in Europe. Dubravko Lakos Bujas joining us from JP Morgan. Uh, we're going to talk about one of their top 2022 trades. Overweight Chinese stocks, that has been certainly a tough trade this year, uh, certainly when it comes to the mega cap names with exposure in the United States in the form of listings. We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. <music> 22 minutes past the hour. So JP Morgan's call on 2022 by everything China. Three of the bank's top 2022 trades involve bullish calls on Chinese assets, including going long local bonds, long the yuan versus the euro, and overweighting Chinese stocks. Dubravko Lekos Bujas, JP Morgan's global head of equity macro research, still with us. Um, China's been a really tough call this year, really tough. Why is next year going to be different? Well, in, in a nutshell, uh, we think that sort of everything that could have gone wrong with respect to China has gone wrong, both on the sort of, you know, re regulatory side, on the policy side. Um, and so, uh, yes, China has been a very tough one. Uh, sentiment and expectations on the China side are very low. Positioning, when you look at various sort of numbers, uh, has also basically completely capitulated. And so we just don't think that the story is over. We think that China as a long-term um, like, you know, as long term as an economy, as a fundamental story, we, we believe generally remains intact. It's just gone through a pretty aggressive rebalance this year. And I think as you go into 2022, 
uh, we think there is a pretty uh, large opportunity for the multiple and for sentiment to improve off of, I call, extreme lows and, and you know, relative to expectations. So that's why, again, it's very hard to sort of exactly time and pinpoint yeah. when the pivot happens. But I think, generally speaking, you want to be looking at allocating greater risk to China over the coming quarters. So, Dubovko, what kind of policy, either fiscal or monetary, does that inherently imply? So we are seeing, so on, on the fiscal side, there's basically been negative fiscal. There's been a fiscal drag, essentially. Credit impulse has been negative. We're starting to see signs of that uh, pivoting. Question is now, obviously, how big of a pivot you get. I, we think we'll definitely get some pivot. Question is just how big. On the monetary side, we're seeing talks of just generally um, uh, you know, triple R cuts. And then on the regulatory side, they've basically gone after multiple industries, multiple key sectors that the foreign world has had a lot of exposure to, so people have gotten burned. And we think the regulatory pressures definitely will be easing in the coming period. So it's, it's a question of putting all of these, if you will, together. Yep. Dubrovko, let's turn to Europe. Um, less impressive performance this year, you could argue, than the US. Uh, but nevertheless, by European standards, incredibly impressive. I, the two basically are still neck and neck. But if you take a look at what has performed in Europe this year, it's been tech and it's been the banks. Are those the sectors that are going to carry on performing into next year? So we think, we think banks have the potential for continuing to perform, not just within Europe, but call it globally. Um, you know, tech, I think, is the area where you, you know, which I think is a little bit tough. We're more neutral on tech and largely because we expect to continue to see large dispersion. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we like high beta over lower beta tech at this point. Uh, but I would say other areas that I would highlight is, is consumer. I think a lot of consumer based areas within Europe, even on the luxury side, have uh, relatively attracted risk reward, especially if you believe the China story has room to, to improve off of the lows and to pivot. And Dubravko, 30 seconds, question from the uh, IB chat here. Are you concerned of the ADRD listing? Not in the near term. You know, it is, it is a risk and it is something that is not going to go away. I think that a decent amount of negativity is already priced in. Um, look, we are basically looking at a two to three year time frame. A lot can happen between now and then. And so I think at this moment, it's not a risk. I don't think it's a risk for 22, yeah. but perhaps something worth revisiting later on. All right, Dubravko, and in two years in COVID time is a whole different story, too. Uh, Dubravko Lakos Bujas, uh, JP Morgan, Global Head of Equity Macro Research. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been way too long. We look forward to having you back. All right, coming up, U.S. producer prices jumping. We're going to speak to Robin Gandhi, GMM nonstick coding CEO next. This is Bloomberg. We're just about an hour into trading right here in the U.S. The Dow trying to get into positive territory, but the Nasdaq still up by about one percentage point. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is here with all the market moves here. It was like a PPI bad news, good news kind of thing. Yeah, and ultimately bad news, or at least skittish news. We have the S&P 500 down about half a percent, down for a second day in a row. The Nasdaq 100 down even more, down about one percent, also down for a second day of, in a row. And of course, this is Fed week. At this point, we see bonds lower. So a little bit of a mixed tone because you have growthier stocks down, but you also have haven bonds down. But take a look at the spike in volatility that VIX up 20 at 22, so above 20. So we're out of complacency. Interesting picture. It seems like we're back and forth, back and forth. If we go into the terminal, we're going to see an interesting picture too because investors are starting to take notice. What we're looking at here in blue is the S&P 500. In white is the put call rate. Ratio. So when it goes higher, it tells you that investors are concerned. So they were concerned in July and then down, down, down. But the point I want to make here is over the last month, even as the S&P 500 was rallying, the put call ratio is going up so clearly, or it would suggest some investors are hedging. But you can see that put call ratio uh, still relatively high, suggesting that investors are, again, a little bit on edge, as suggested by the VIX. And supporting this picture, investors just don't know what to make of all the macro uncertainties between the virus, the Fed, inflation. 
inflation. Uh, commodities are also sliding. That Bloomberg Commodity Index down on the day, down, I believe, for a second session in a row, down about six tenths of one percent, really being weighed on by oil, natural gas, and silver. And of course, oil and natural gas guy tells on the economy in terms of the global growth uh, expectations. And perhaps you can make a little bit of a case about that around silver, too. Silver down well more than gold because of some of the industrial uses, guys. So a bit of a cautious tone for a second day in a row. Yeah, it does kind of feel like that. And it's interesting, obviously, the Fed meeting starts today. We get that result tomorrow. That's got to be factored into all of this. Who knows? Could we get a hawkish surprise? Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Let's talk about some of the inputs the Fed is going to be thinking about. Prices paid to U.S. producers rose more than expected last month. For more on rising input costs, let's bring in Ravine Gandhi, GMM Nonstick Coating CEO. GMM is not only a fantastic Bloomberg function, but GMM is also a supplier uh, to houseware names. Most of us know KitchenAid, Pyrex, Black & Decker, all of those kinds of great things uh, that you have in your house. Um, Ravine, nice to see you. Thanks for your time today. We always appreciate getting an update on what is going on. Look, final demand, US PPI rose 9.6% year on year. Do you think that number is underplaying the reality of what the factory story is right now? So um, when I spoke to you a couple months ago, I mentioned that we had raised prices around 15% uh, up to about 25%. So yeah, I do think there probably is some understatement there. And, you know, I just, it clearly, given the numbers we're seeing, this stuff is all ending up at the foot of the U.S. consumer. But so far, Ravine, we haven't seen any real decline in demand hit for that. Um, we talk a lot about uh, household spending power. We talk a lot about the dry powder just stored up, kind of waiting to be spent. Where have you noticed any consumer hesitancy if you've had to increase prices upwards of 25%? So we, I mean, obviously we're a tier two supplier. So all of my POs come from the big manufacturers. So we're kind of trying to read the tea leaves. The, the truth is the biggest reason why we've seen a slowdown in November and December is supply chain stuff. So our big American consumers, I mean, I'm sorry, our big American clients are a little bit gun shy to put in POs because uh, of, of all the shipping and the supply chain stuff. In, you know, in terms of infl inflation, I agree with you. Uh, a little inflation, you know, has not seemed to hurt anybody. But I, you know, I started my business in 2007. And I remember everyone was so optimistic and in 08. We almost went under because of that recession that, that nobody saw. So I'm always a little bit nervous that when you have unexpected consumer pressure, things can change very quickly. And I know we haven't seen it yet, but that's what kind of keeps me up at night. Just in terms of just backing up to the supply chain story, any sign that things are easing up? Any optimism, any green shoots about maybe things starting to get a little bit better? Yeah, um, about eight weeks ago, we had about 120 containers piled up at various ports in China, you know, on their way to the West Coast. That number has been uh, cut in half mm. at this point. So I do, I definitely see it getting better. Perhaps it's related to some of the action the administration has taken with the ports. I'm, I'm not really sure on that, but it definitely seems to be, you know, getting better. On the flip side, Ravine, I'm wondering with the Omicron cases that are climbing everywhere, we've seen certain areas of China that needed to shut their ports again because of that zero tolerance COVID policy. Do you have any sense of kind of what you're looking at in the next three months or so? I, I think from a COVID perspective, um, it's actually still pretty bad in China. I don't mean from a cases perspective. I just mean from a shutdown and regulation perspective. This stuff is changing all the time. You know, we have a few plants in China. We have an office in Hong Kong. We have a lot of people in Hong Kong who have not been to China in two years because wow. it, you know, it's you, you, you take a day trip and you have to do a two week pre quarantine, a two week quarantine when you get there. So it can take over a month to just go back and forth. So people <laughs> obviously aren't doing it. So it is, it is definitely a mess uh, from a COVID, COVID perspective. And, and that has been one of the biggest challenges. On, on top of that, We've had people who were based in one of our Asian locations this year come over to the States a few times. And suddenly, in one case, a guy was trying to get on a flight in San Francisco to go back to Beijing. And suddenly they didn't let him on the plane because China had just changed a regulation that you needed a test that was within 24 hours. So he had to wait an extra week in San Francisco, go to the Chinese embassy, which is highly non-communicative, get a test. And so China is really, really tough on COVID. So given all of that, given what you said about the China story, the supply chain story, what's happening with the U.S. consumer, 
what does next year look like? You've raised prices significantly this year, 15 to 25 percent, as you say. Is that something you see being repeated next year or is this a one off price shock? I, I mean, we certainly don't expect to do anything of that level. If that if that has yeah, to okay. be the case and something has has been historic, what, what we really are doing is uh, we are buying ahead. We are consolidating our big spend of our key components to our most important vendors. So that's one thing we're doing. The other thing we're doing is, you know, we're all about innovation, you know, in our company. So we're trying to just innovate and innovate and keep our products better than our competitors. Because if we start to be seen as a commodity and there's someone who can save a client 5%, they're going to switch. So for us, it's keeping, it's, it's keeping that quality high. So let's just pretend for a second, Ravine, that we see a Fed that's going to speed up um, its tapering program, which leaves room to hike a little earlier. Well, how does that affect your business? I mean, they're going to do it because of inflation, in theory. You're in the middle of inflation. How does that affect you? Well, I mean, from our perspective, I mean, if I put on my macroeconomic hat, I would say, let's just say uh, it's all about the U.S. consumer. So if those rates end up causing situations like we saw in the, the late 70s or the early 80s in America, obviously we had a tremendous recession. And like we said earlier in this interview, we don't see that yet. But that's what, what worries me. You know, while I was waiting here, I was listening to your previous guest, and what I was hearing was just kind of unbridled optimism. You know, he said, oh, everything's going to be fine, and I think things are going to come out better than expected. As an entrepreneur, I completely hope he's right. But we just have to deal with what happens. You know, we lived through uh, 08, and, and so I know that if that happens, uh, I'll never bet against America. I think the American consumer kind of saves everything, but all we can do is just hope for greater visibility from, from our clients. Right now, it's like 30 days, and we're used to six months. Hmm. So, so how different is the business now? How different is the way you run your business? I spent my life talking to airline CEOs. I, they're all about the balance sheet. That is the only way that they see their businesses being protected. Now, they're in a super volatile part of the business at the moment, but you've described some pretty volatile things going on in your sector as well. When, when investors think about next year and they think about innovation, they think about companies that, like you, kind of make stuff, produce things that the U.S. consumer is going to be consuming, like pots and pans, quite literally, is that, do you think, going to be the kind of the last place to fall? I'm just trying to think of how investors should think about the relative performance of, of GMM versus a tech company versus an airline versus a kind of... How do you see, see things shaking out? Do you think the US consumer will continue to buy pots and pans but maybe not buy a new iPhone or maybe not take that trip? How does it work in your mind in terms of the kind of the relative importance of the, of, of the things that we can all buy? Um, so I think one of the, first of all, I do believe that people continue to buy pots and pans. You know, every day 40 million people use the pots and pans that we've coded. I, I think people need to eat. So I think we're safe in that regard. To, to answer, I think what you were really, you know, getting at from kind of a, a theme perspective. Um, so, you know, I started this business in 07 and we sold it about 10 years later to a multi-billion dollar Japanese company. Since then, we've bought another business that was one of our competitors based in Zurich. And so we've gotten very global. We are now building multiple plants around the world. And I think that this theme of global and the big getting bigger to a certain extent at the expense of the little guy is a very clear theme that we've seen in the economy. I think we saw that in COVID when a lot of the, the, you know, the tech stocks got bigger, stocks went through the roof despite the lockdown at the expense of the little guy. So if I was an investor, I would look at businesses that, that have a runway in terms of expansion globally, have the ability to produce in multiple countries. You know, we have plants in a number of countries. So I'm able to allocate demand. Uh, if, if we can't get materials in one of our two China facilities, I can move that stuff to India. Mm. And that, that's been a giant blessing for us. In fact, we're seeing tremendous growth in our Indian operation. We're seeing a lot of our U.S. buyers talking about India. Our sister company yeah. is putting up a plant in Malaysia. So that, to me, is a big theme that I think about that, you know, maybe that has legs from an inv investor perspective, but that's kind of above my uh, my pay grade. To be clear, I would much rather get a KitchenAid mixer than go on vacation right now. I don't 
really know what that says about me. Okay, uh, Ravin, thanks a lot. Ravin Gandhi, GMM Nonstick Coding CEO, thanks very much. Let's update you right now. Uber up by 7% right now. It's CEO speaking in a UBS conference uh, saying that the hurdle for acquisitions for next year is quite high, but that the ad business is well ahead of expectations and profitable Lyft also rising as well uh, in sympathy to those higher Uber prices. All right, coming up, we're going to learn more about Omicron in the two weeks after the variants and discovery. We're going to break it down with Gregory Poland. Lots of data coming out today from South Africa, as well as uh, some efficacy about the COVID pill from Pfizer. We're going to dissect all of that with Gregory Poland, Mayo Clinic Vaccine Research Group Director. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishka Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Mike Dugan, the mayor of Detroit, 12.30 p.m. New York time, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Rishka Gupta. Two studies out today show mixed results about Pfizer's experimental COVID pill, according to data. The pill was highly effective at keeping patients out of the hospital, but it didn't do as good a job at erasing those milder symptoms often associated with breakthrough infections. The results suggest the Pfizer pill will likely be used for COVID patients at risk of developing severe disease. And the UK will use soccer stadiums and race courses as it opens up hundreds more vaccination sites in the coming days. According to the government, the new Omicron variant of the coronavirus now counts for 20% of confirmed cases in England. The estimated number of daily infections has climbed to 200,000. In the northeastern U.S., officials are trying every tactic to control a surge of coronavirus cases that has emergency rooms overflowing and infection rates soaring. New York is requiring masks in all indoor places across the state. Massachusetts is sending home free test kits to its poorest areas. Hospital admissions for COVID climbed 14% in the week ending December the 9th. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex. All right. Thanks so much, Ritika. Just bathed in positivity uh, from those headlines. So let's get more on the virus now. Dr. Gregory Poland, Mayo Clinic Vaccine Research Group Director. Dr. Poland, there's lots to get through, but I wanted to start in that South African study that shows 70% protection against hospitalizations with a two-shot dose of the Pfizer vaccine, but only 33% effective against getting the variant. What's your assessment of those numbers? Well, I think those are uh, preliminary numbers, but I think they are likely to be correct numbers. In other words, the vaccine, and this has been true all the way through the pandemic, the vaccine is much better at blocking significant severe disease, hospitalization and death than it is in preventing mild and even moderate infection. Just in terms of the big picture, are you worried right now? I am, uh, Guy, uh, and I think, you know, this is news no one wants to hear. Uh, my own prediction, and I'll, I'll use a, a kind of loaded word, I think we're going to have an explosion of cases. And the reason for that is the extreme transmissibility and infectiousness of this variant will lead to an exponential rise in cases. And the problem with exponentiality is that humans are very poor decision makers under conditions of exponentiality. Looking at what this is doing by this week or next week, Omicron will be the dominant virus in the UK and in Denmark. It is getting to that stage in the mm -hmm. state of Washington. And the US will follow uh, all the way through, as will then the rest of the world. So, Dr. Pollan, clearly that's a tough word to hear, explosion, uh, when it comes to COVID cases. Um, the, on the other side of the, uh, of the balance here, you have effective vaccines. You have the COVID Pfizer pill that seems to be also very good at preventing hospitalizations. You have the theory that if you have this uh, less severe strain, even if it's more transmissible, becoming the dominant variant, that's actually a good thing. People will develop their own natural immunity along with vaccines. What is your assessment of those sort of on the other side of the ledger? Yeah, and that's, uh, Alex, you're exactly right. There's, there's a tension there, isn't there? Uh, let's call it two sides of the coin. On the one hand, 
we've got a highly infectious variant, only 60% of Americans fully vaccinated, widespread rejection and hesitancy in regards to wearing masks, distancing, the vaccine, cold weather, uh, extraordinary amounts of travel during the holidays. The other side of that coin is while we have two threats, Delta and Omicron, we have one solution. And that solution is to get boosted, to get fully immunized and boosted and wear masks. Now, what happens when somebody gets infected? That's where you know we have reason to celebrate. By the way, we're, we're celebrating the one year anniversary of the first rollout of the mRNA Pfizer vaccine, which is a great human achievement. But we should also celebrate the fact that the death rate has generally fallen from COVID because we now know how to better take care of those patients, how to ventilate them, what drugs are effective and the many drugs that are not, antivirals, as you mentioned, um, and monoclonal antibodies. In fact, one of the interesting things is a set of two monoclonal antibodies that's now been approved for uh, prevention, so for pre-exposure yeah. risk, and they protect people for as long as six months. Final quick question from me, Dr. Poland. As you say, we now have, we, we are well on our way here in the UK and over in Denmark to Omicron being the dominant variant. How important in terms of our understanding of what comes next will the next two or three weeks be, maybe even the next 10 days be here in the UK? If we see I, the largely boosted 40 to 50 year old plus population having a pickup in hospitalizations, do we then have a massive problem, a global problem? If we don't no, get that, can we dismiss Omicron as being a serious threat? Yeah, no, no question. I don't know that we can do that guy within 10 days, but I think over the next several weeks to a month, we'll have a good, much better idea. Remember that hospitalizations lag behind uh, case rates and death lags behind hospitalization. So you're talking about a month plus to really understand that. And remember, uh, one thing I think people forget about, think about at the next level, when you have this contagious and mutated a variant, is that a setup for that variant mutating and becoming something yet worse. All right, doctor, we always appreciate uh, your perspective. Thank you so very much, Dr. Gregory Poland of the Mayo Clinic. Do some breaking news for you coming out of D.C. Senate Democrats are releasing their debt limit resolution and they're looking to increase the debt limit by about two and a half trillion dollars. This comes as Senator Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell have been trying to work on some kind of deal to raise the debt ceiling uh, limit. That limit uh, now wishing to be raised by two and a half trillion dollars, uh, according to Senate Democrats. S&P right around the lows of the session now off by a full percentage point. This is Bloomberg. Just over 30 minutes to the European close. We're counting you down to the end of trading this Tuesday. Stocks certainly under pressure. Uh, 470. We're flirting with that line here. We're down by around seven tenths of one percent. Alex, I'll update you on what's happening stateside in just a moment where tech certainly taking a turn. Gas futures continue to climb. This is the fear. This is the inflation narrative in Europe, which could upend the ECB, which nobody's talking about at the moment. Everybody's kind of parked the ECB. It's all about the Fed and the Bank of England. Well, maybe this gas story is going to be one you want to pay attention to. It's up by another 8% today. Uh, the new German uh, foreign minister, Baerbock, talking about the fact uh, that there's still significant steps to go uh, in terms of the certification of Nord Stream 2. Uh, unbundling required security needs to be resolved. Euro dollar, though, absolutely flat, which is interesting in as much as the risk off in stocks has generally led to a stronger dollar. That's not happening right now. 112.74 euro dollar. But tech, Alex, certainly taking it on the chin at the moment. Yep. And here in the U.S., you have the Na uh, Nasdaq really rolling over. The tech index within the S&P is off a full two percentage points. The Nasdaq, um, the S&P rolling over to the lows of the session here. Interestingly enough, though, uh, energy and financials are in the green. So it's not as, as risk off as you might think. There's still some cyclicals. Uh, they're getting a bit of a bid. Now, part of that has to do with the bond market uh, dropping like a stone, yields popping higher, particularly on the back end. So that curve is steepening, which is obviously going to be helping financials here. Uh, but like I mentioned, tech, communication services, real estate, consumer discretion, all of that uh, getting hit pretty hard. S&P down 1%. 
I guess this raises the question, Guy, what's now priced in? And you've been raising this one, which yep. is a good one. What would constitute now a hawkish surprise? Do we have to look at the other end of the spectrum now? To be fair, Cameron Cries raised it. I'm just parroting him. Uh, I'm not that smart. Um, I, I, but it does make you wonder. I get that's what the base case is. And people are talking about the Fed maybe needing to be hawkish. Certainly, that's the line from Dudley, Mohammed, Aleri, and et cetera. What does that actually look like? Just an update on what is happening in the States, Alex. Um, Gregory Poland uh, maybe causing a little bit of uh, concern uh, uh, on, the, on the Alex front at the moment about what comes next. Omicron accounted for 3% of U.S. virus cases in the uh, December the 11th week, says the CDC. Omicron variant has been detected in 33 U.S. states. Yep. Um, CDC posts the latest Omicron data on the agency website if you are interested. Uh, okay, what's coming up next? We'll continue the market chats. Charlotte Ryland, CCLA Investment Management co-head of investments is joining us next. This is Bloomberg.